Welcome back. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we are looking at uh, career and technical education funding at the moment, given the impact of late on uh, some of the challenges facing our, our career and tech centers. So we've invited Scott Farr from the, uh, the director of the River Valley Technical Center School District to just give us a, a, a reminder as to, and, and let us know about the progress. You were in earlier, but could, you could give us an update on, on the current concerns, we'd be appreciate that. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having us back for a second time. That must mean it wasn't very painless the first time. And uh, we were over at uh, Senate Education and, uh, you know, thanks for having us back and seeing the urgency of, uh, the issue, you know, we're just school administrators trying to make it work. We have no special interest other than serving our our students. So we're a little naive how all this works. So thanks for having us back again. And uh, I have share screen, Jesse. Yes. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Beautiful. It worked great. Um, so again, there's my intro. Um, yeah. So to do a greatest hits tour of what we talked about before is the, the issue started last year when COVID started and it, uh, it hit in the middle of our recruitment season. We didn't finish recruitment. Some, so that affected our enrollment. Um, our sending schools were spending a fair amount of triage and just trying to get their students through the end of a very trying and traumatic year, getting them to log in and take the classes. And then that turned into kind of pushing scheduling down the road. It was rushed. Um, it didn't get, happen until right before the start of the school. Um, a lot of centers saw, hey, we thought this many were going to come. And then 40 or 50 didn't come for a variety of reasons. Some of that... Um, it's just related to health and safety and students thinking, uh, parents thinking they didn't want to have their students mix. Did they not do well in their classes um, that were remote the year before? That means that they had to maybe repeat some classes and they couldn't fit uh, a tech center program in their schedule. Um, we, so we had some enrollment drops at the beginning of the year. We had attrition through the year and the failures that I recommended. Some of the challenges were related to the coordinating of the various schedules between multiple sending schools that whether it was the days that they were in session or the times of the day that they held the remote classes that didn't always jive and wasn't very coordinated. And some of this was just simply because of the capacity issues with the six feet uh, distancing. It's no fault of anybody's. It's just where we were at that time. And again, I mentioned some parents maybe made the choice that they didn't want to send their students to a place where there would be the mixing with multiple other students. And, you know, I was talking with a group of directors and where we were back then and where we are now, we found that we were a little bit more comfortable with what's going on and that the masks really work. And, um, but we didn't know that back then. Um, so that brings us to recruitment season in the middle of COVID, which as I said before, starts in January through March. And um, in preparation for this, pre for this uh, testimony, we gathered uh, information, which Jay will share a little bit later, but there was a significant drop in the majority of the centers of how many applications came in. And, you know, applications lead to enrollment. And it's just not the same when you um, recruit remotely, no matter how creative and how whiz bang the videos are that you come up with, it's just not the same as having students in the building picturing themselves in their future. Um, so outreach and recruitment, remote activities, I know that everybody tried all kinds of different things, it's just not the same. And then we couldn't have the in-person visits as follow-up. Sometimes if a student's on the fence as far as whether they wanna come, they come in shadow for an afternoon or a morning just to see if there was a real reason that they were excited about it and can they fit them, see themselves there long term. All those usual things just couldn't happen this year. So, you know, it's a little bit different story of the financial hit for every center because the fickleness of the six semester average, which determines our funding. And it depends if you're rising or falling. Are you replacing 
uh, a good year of enrollment with a really poor year of enrollment, maybe four semesters back. It's all tightly tied to the number of students that um, walk through the door. And um, so there's a fickleness in the six semester average and every center is at a little bit different place as far as that rise and fall. And um, so our first COVID re recruitment season was just this last year and that'll be for our enrollments in the fall of this year. Um, it'll take six semesters beyond October of 2022 because that will be the first time we get a chance to have a COVID free recruitment season. So this will be with us um, six semesters beyond October uh, of 2022. Um, so speculating and looking in the crystal ball, though probably the worst FTE burden due to Lois could possibly be in October of 2024. Um, that puts our programming in jeopardy. You know, as a school, we only have only certain places that we can go to um, reduce our expenses, and that's usually personnel. Um, and I would argue that, and I have argued that, <laughs> The COVID, uh, COVID has infected CTE more than any other school in the state, the school system, types of school in the state because of how we're funded. That um, it's about students walking to the door and all the other public schools in the state for the most part is voters vote on a budget and there it is. It's not, there isn't a price tag on each student. So mm -hmm. solutions. Held harmless, but that leads to ghost students. And I know that was brought up in both committees. Um, maybe some sort of direct financial um, relief. Um, that's independent of just passing the cost on to our sending schools. Uh, we could reduce staff and programming, but I don't think that's very desirable given where we are as far as um, the workforce situation in our state, and that's our primary um, primary focus. And for some years, the, the reduction in, for some centers, the reduction in staff is going to start next year. Um, that the impacts are starting because the first semester that we're impacted by COVID in the six semester average is this fall. We could pass on the cost to our sending school, and but that. Would, would add to a barrier that's already there. Um, you know, the funding system is a barrier and it's a hit to the local high school budget when they send more kids to CT. It's probably not a good idea to, let's hit that again with more and a higher cost. Um, we could ramp up a funding system change, which has been in the works, or we could creatively use uh, COVID relief funds because if they're, if we've been very much impacted by COVID in a very unique way, we believe it's an applicable use. I think there's been testimony by Brad James previously that COVID relief funds could be used. I know that there's a level of relief that is happening with the ADM for high schools. I think that's around 3%. I don't know the solution because how the use and applicable uses of COVID relief funds is there's rules coming out every day about that, but I know that we're impacted and that, uh, we, we need a solution that's going to significantly impact what we're able to do in our, in our mission to serve the state. So thank you very much for letting me have another shot at it. There's a lot of people who've been working hard at this. The director's been putting information in and um, I've shared all the information I'm able to gather with everybody in CTE and Jay um, has that and I think he'll, uh, he'll take it another step. So uh, thanks again. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go now to Jay Ramsey, and then we can open up for questions. Thank you. Um, is it possible I can share? Yep. My can screen? you switch that screen sharing? Let's see. Get all set now, Jay. Thank you. Now I just have to. <laughs> Um, all right. Uh, 
I'm happy to bring that up for you, Jay, as well. I think I have it now. Let me just get it over here so I can. So it looks like I'm talking to you. Can you see federal funds for CTE? No, we see that you have the screen, but we don't see anything here. All right. Sorry. I guess I don't know how to undo it. <laughs> okay. Maybe Jesse can do it. I got it now. Let's let me try it again. Okay. So you can see it now. We can. Okay. Um, let me. Well, I'll just leave it like this. So I'm Jay Ramsey. I am the Assistant Division Director of the Student Pathways Division at the Agency of Education, and I help lead and support the uh, workforce preparation programs at the agency, so career technical education and adult education and literacy. And I do have three slides at the end of this about adult education and literacy, but I understand the primary purpose to be around CTE this, uh, this time. So um, here's a map of the state. As you all know, the state is divided into regions and our technical centers serve assigned regions. Um, I'm highlighting three different areas because it's relevant to, or four different areas because it's relevant to how uh, we are able to give funds um, from the emergency relief fund. So you see the St. Johnsbury region is green. That's because that region is served by um, private schools. St. Johnsbury Academy and Linden Institute um, as private schools serve the region for CTE. And then Middlebury and Springfield and Bennington are served by independent technical center districts. And um, that has some implications as we discovered last year um, in the spring for access to relief funds. So in this family of emergency relief funds under the CARES Act, we have ESSER, GEAR, and CRF. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each three, uh, each of those, and then I'll talk about some state funds. So ESSER <clears throat> was $28 million made available to um, LEAs. And what that means for CTE is that there are 12 centers that are hosted by LEAs. And that means that the LEA may opt to uh, direct funds to their technical center. Um, the agency is reminding LEAs to engage with their CTE centers on these funds, um, but it is up to uh, each LEA how the funds will be given out. Then we move on to GEAR, which is the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund, and Governor Scott determined um, that these funds should be directed to the technical centers. Um, and our, the eligibility for these funds follows Perkins, and that means that um, it includes the independent CTE districts because they are technical centers, but in Caledonia County, it means that we couldn't give money directly to St. Johnsbury Academy and Linden Institute, but um, they are part of a consortium that includes the three LEAs that serve the region, and those LEAs contract with Linden Institute and St. Johnsbury Academy for CTE services. And as part of that, uh, are able to pass along gear funds through the contract. Um, the allocation was $4.48 million, um, 200,000 of which uh, came to the agency to administer the program. And our allocations were based on poverty and broadband access. And these funds are available through um, September 30th, 2022. And it provided an opportunity for us to have some alignment across emergency programs um, so that this program would cover costs that um, would not be covered by other programs. Um, sorry. So we said that um, <clears throat> there were four different categories, sorry, of allowable cost personnel technology infrastructure, instructional costs, and other, which some examples were um, vehicles to transport project supplies to students when they were at home. Um, the actual funded activities fall under these sort of categories, tools, equipment, supplies, 
Um, so I'll, I'll read a few examples so that you get a sense of how the funds have been used. Um, so laptops and iPads capable of supporting software and applications that can't run on Chromebooks or ex existing school laptops, or that had previously been accessed on desktop computers in program labs and the program computers, um, the desktops couldn't be distributed to students at home. Um, upgraded teaching technology so teachers can live stream demonstrations to students who couldn't be in person on a given day. Um, online textbooks, curriculum, and credentialing. Um, under the additional staffing category, uh, some centers hired additional instructional aides to allow for half of the students to be in the shop with the teacher, while the other half work with the aid on related content uh, in a separate physical space. Some centers have hired full-time substitutes. Some centers hired part-time nurses because the nursing services of the attached high schools were not adequate to meet the agency and Department of Health requirements. And under transportation, um, centers have requested funds to uh, transport students on days when they're sending high schools are operating on a remote schedule, but the student could attend in-person instruction at the tech center or um, tools and project materials that needed to be transported to students' um, communities or directly to students' homes. Additional classroom space. Um, some centers have shown creativity in using temporary structures. And then um, in the last category, there are recruiting practice changes. As um, Scott mentioned, the, the need to re-examine how the tech centers are recruiting students. Um, and one particular example, Randolph Technical Career Center used um, the money to purchase um, what's essentially a a food trailer that allow, will allow them to go into communities um, and recruit students. Um, it's a branded trailer that will serve food at different functions. That was one of their creative uses of funds that solves a pandemic problem, but um, also solves some other problems that existed before the pandemic. Um, so those are some examples of how those um, funds have been used. Oops. So I'll move into um, CTE tuition. So outside of federal emergency fund supports. Um, and so this is a little bit of teaching and reminding here that the CTE base funding from the state is based on full-time equivalents. And that's a function of the time that students split between their home high school and the tech center. And our funding mechanism uh, currently relies on a rolling six semester average. And we're looking at fall and spring semester enrollments and it changes over time. Um, the translation for this one would be when there are sustained peaks or sustained valleys in the FTE count that has long impacts on both the CTE budgets and the tuition paid by sending high schools. So this slide, keep going too far, um, is four years worth of state level uh, FTE data. And it's the aggregate number of all CTE centers. And the column to the left is gonna drop off. The column to the right is the first year of the pandemic. So we can see at the state level, it doesn't seem like there is much of a problem. But when we start to drill down at the regional level, that's where we begin to see some interesting things. And now this chart looks at only the fall counts of the three years before the pandemic. And it's organized by Tech Center. The left, so if we look at Burlington Technical Center, the left column is FY17, the middle column is FY18, and the right hand column is FY19. And I have put arrows to indicate trends over the three years. So um, the overall trends prior to the pandemic give us a sense of where each center was headed. And each, um, and we're using the fall counts because it's consistent. Um, I know that Brad James came in and talked about the difference between the fall and spring semester enrollments. Spring is always a little bit lower. Um, 
But here you can see that there are nine centers with an upward trend in the fall counts, and there are seven centers with a downward trend in the fall counts. And there's one center that um, doesn't have any data because there was an error and I didn't have time to research the error to prepare the testimony, so I, my apologies. Um, so pre-pandemic, and now I'm gonna show you this um, fall 2017 bar is going to drop off and then we're gonna see fall 2020 in the lavender color. So this chart is displaying the three most recent fall semesters including the pandemic, the, the fall 2020. Um, so looking specifically, the arrows are looking specifically at the last two fall semesters. So pre-pandemic and during pandemic, we saw eight centers with an uptick in FTEs compared to nine in the pre-pandemic analysis. We see eight centers with a downward tick in FTEs compared with seven in the pre-pandemic analysis. And what we can, you know, say on this is the pandemic has had unequal impacts on CTE regions across the state. Five centers experienced a positive shift in FTEs, so Burlington, Cold Hollow, North Country, Northwest, and Southwest. It had no effect on three centers, meaning that they had a continued positive growth, Barry, Stafford, and Riverbend. And it reversed upward trends at six centers and that made FTE counts worse at three centers. So um, as Scott said, I'm gonna to shift to another type of indicator that we, um, the state doesn't collect it, but um, for our purposes, we were, uh, Scott asked the directors to talk to, to talk about how many applications they've had um, and compare it to May 19 before the pandemic. So as Scott said, recruiting is important. Recruiting leads to applications and applications lead to enrollments, hopefully. So seven centers report having fewer applications when compared to May 2019, a range of minus six all the way up to minus 128. A minus 128 applications is a significant number of applications. Four centers report having more applications. And then there are six centers that haven't recorded anything in, in the sheet that we were using. Um, so having said all of this, and as it stands, the next few slides are looking at some specific financial implications. And at the, at the state support level, two things would be impacted. Um, salary assistance for the assistant director position and the tuition reduction or supplemental assistance grants that are included in the statute. Um, if we look at the salary assistance for assistant directors, this line represents the threshold that exists for that salary assistance. It's uh, 150 FTEs. And uh, in order to be eligible to receive salary assistance for this position, the centers have to have 150 FTEs or more. And it looks like Burlington and Central Vermont Career Center just passed the threshold, but they could go backwards next year. It, and it's unclear what other centers would be impacted next year. And we won't have that data from for the FTEs until November. Um, and then we go to the tuition reduction and it look, and this is just a simple FTE times 35% um, of the base head amount. So it looks like six centers would be losing supplemental assistance ranging from 3000 to 18,000 and nine centers would be gaining supplemental assistance, 2,800 up to 27,500. Um, so to kind of recap what you've heard from Scott and what I'm saying, fewer students or declining FTEs means fewer tuition dollars. Centers who see declining enrollments and related declines in FTEs or who have peaks and valleys have two choices. One is to 
cut expenses. The other is to increase tuition. Um, the quickest way to cut expenses, as you heard from Scott, would be to cut salaries and benefits, which means either reducing the capacity of a program, cutting the teacher's hours, or eliminating a program, riffing a teacher. The second way is to keep the pr program portfolio intact and increase tuition with the hope that the reduced enrollments and reduced revenue is a temporary problem, but it becomes uh, cyclical. If you raise tuition, will high schools then not send more students? This um, slide is showing the different changes from FY21 to FY22 in announced tuition. So the green bars are the centers that increase tuition and by how much, and the yellow bars are the centers that um, decrease tuition and by how much. The average increase was $511.18. Two centers had no increase, that's Stafford and Wyndham. Seven centers dropped tuition, seven centers increased tuition. And I can't see a correlation between um, pandemic FTE shifts and budget increases or decreases. There are lots of factors that go into it. Um, so I'm just presenting this as information to you. And so this is the um, getting to the solutions. In the short term, we're at the agency working through multiple options and some of which may need legislative intervention. In the longer term, um, changing how we fund CTE would be part of the solution. And in 2018, the legislature passed Act 189, which created um, funding pilots and Scott Center, uh, River Valley, and the centers in Bennington and Middlebury uh, really stepped up and took the lead to try to figure out what a model would be that could work. Um, the agency uh, report for Act 189 is still um, pending approval, but uh, we do have some recommendations that will be coming out, uh, which include a request for funding to support contracted consultants to finish studying the impacts of changing the system and uh, funding to support local implementation. And that's this is the end of my slides about CTE. And then um, do I have, have to, do we have a date on on when that report should be ready? I am told any day now I don't have a, a date, unfortunately. OK, we know we know about any date now <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic. So, OK, thank you. Um, questions. I, I'm just noticing that we were given options of holding harmless, decreasing stat, which has this problem with ghost students, decreasing staffing and programming, which doesn't sound like something that uh, we're that interested in doing right now, given what we're looking at in terms of workforce development. Passing on costs to the other schools also sounds like a problem. And then there's just direct financial assistance, which did happen with gear in the past. Um, I don't know if this is something you can respond to, but I think all of us have the question here is can, uh, is, there, is there a thought? We recognize that the legislature doesn't have any uh, control over gear. Um, is there consideration at the agency or administration to use gear funds for such a purpose, understanding that they that the governor has quite a bit of flexibility on how those funds are used? Um, well, I want to say about gear, the first version of gear, because there's gear funds. The, the first version of gear was really intended to help the tech centers respond to some sort of emerging and immediate needs. Um, in terms of uh, helping uh, <laughs> with virtual learning and you know responding in a way that the tech centers really had never had to respond before or to educate students that way. So that was CARES. That came out of CARES. Yes. Yeah. The, the gear funds under that family of CARES Act funds. 
and and there's gear too. Um, I I'm not part of any discussions about um, how those funds would be used. I I don't know that the governor has made a decision yet. Uh, we've certainly submitted you know a few proposals for how they could be used. That I think maybe when Secretary French comes in, it might be a, a good conversation topic for him. And do you have a sense of the amount of money that would be needed to keep our, our centers whole during this period of time without reducing programs and staffing? I, I don't have a sense um, at this moment, but the thought has occurred to us to reach out to all of them to say, what, what is it going to take to um, make it so that you don't have to cut programs or cut your staff? just to sort of make them whole for the next year, which would give us a little more time to uh, come up with a, a longer term strategy. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna to go to Scott Farr and then Representative Conlon. Jane handed that, that there's, there's taking care of it for next year, but then there's, you know, two or three years afterwards uh, that this could be with us, so. Um, yeah, there's passion to hold for next year, but then the future is a little more uncertain depending on what the FTE counts are and does recruitment come back. And so, so there's it's a it's a, it's a little bit more of a long term deal. Right, that that is that is clear. We do have some significant amount of money with us right now, so looking at how we might uh, structure going forward. Representative Conlon. Uh, thank you. Um, Jay, when you were doing your presentation, you sort of attributed declines in enrollment for 21 as being pandemic related, but arguably that's only, it could be for other reasons as well. For example, yeah. Burlington doesn't have a center. It could be because we're, bubbles have just graduated and we have fewer students in our high schools. And I know that's the case in Addison County. Sure. Um, I just want to make sure that's a fair thing to say. Uh, yeah, I think um, I think it would be hard to suss out what was pandemic related and what what wasn't. There, you know, there were certainly um, ebbs and flows in FTEs prior to the pandemic, and um, I I think it's fair to say there's a whole range of reasons why it could be. Um, it seems like right now, many of the things could be about the pandemic. And as Scott said, families making decisions not to enroll or uh, in a couple of instances, I've heard um, students really wanted to come to the tech center, but because of the pod structure that their sending schools put in place, they were forced to decide not to. Um, there, there's a, a whole host of reasons why we would be, we're in this spot that we're in with the FTAs yeah. now. But, and, and I think it's also fair to say that phantom students versus raising tuition essentially does the same thing to the sending school. It just charges them more money. Uh, so, and I guess I, guess I would suggest um, that, that a, a better solution here is that we've got sending schools who are sitting on millions of dollars in federal aid and CTEs that don't have access, that really haven't had access to that aid, and this aid can cover um, this, that, that there seems to be a, you know, it's that relationship that really needs to almost be at the heart of a solution here. Um, phantom students, uh, you know, it takes money off the Ed Fund, whereas federal funding doesn't. Um, anyway, I just wanted to put that out there. And you know, and I, I certainly hope I'm not seeming unsympathetic to this issue. Um, as somebody who a had a had a student at a CTE this year, and b is in desperate need of carpenters, plumbers, and electricians, I uh, <laughs> fully support your work. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I um, I think we recognize that the sending schools have this money in a, in the you know first few slides. I said it really relies on the relationship between the sending schools and the tech center to be able to negotiate or navigate this. How do we? How does the tech center get access to these funds? And and I think ultimately 
can come down to the question of, well, if the host high school is wanting to contribute some money to the tech center, then should it be an equal share among all of the districts in the region, or is it just the responsibility of the host high school? And that question has come up once already, and we're working on a on the response to it. But the more we advocate for CTEs to access the sending school federal emergency funds, um, I think there these types of questions are going to come up. Are you meeting with uh, CTEs? I mean, we've been we certainly have been hearing legislators have been hearing from the CTEs. So, are you meeting with the CTEs now to try to come up with this? Uh, Ruth Durkee is the state CTE director. She meets with them regularly, and I meet with her on a regular basis. And Scott and I have um, pretty regular contact. Um, so, I I feel like I have a, a sense of what's going on out there, and I know that if I call any of them, they will help get, give me the answer that we're looking for. And there is gear, there is gear three money. There's uh, the governor has yet to assign what gear two is. And maybe there's gear three. I, I am just aware of gear two. Yeah. Are there questions either for Scott Farr? Yeah, a quick response to Representative Conlin that as the person would probably be negotiating that with my sending school superintendents, it is a bit of an awkward place to put my tin cup out. <laughs> but, you know, if we if there was some legislative or agency guidance that would set parameters to, you know, what we're negotiating about, that might help uh, coax that conversation um, along and, it, and as Jay hinted at, it's a little bit different as an independent versus a supervisory union, but I think with some parameters on how that would proceed, I think that would be helpful um, helpful to us. Again, all solutions are, are welcomed. I, I, and just, I, I think I would agree with that. It is a, and I'm, I'm on a school board of ascending school to an independent CTE and I understand absolutely where you're coming from and, and some guidance I think would be very helpful. I, I think we can do that. And that would be, be great. We would certainly be interested in, in any part that, that we could play to facilitate this. Uh, I know our committee and the legislature as well as the administration cares a great deal about our career in tech education centers and the importance that they have, not only for education, but for our economy and workforce development. Thank you. So I believe we are reaching out to the secretary at this point to see if there's um, a path forward. I believe, um, Jesse, um, you, have, you are reaching out to the agency to seek some uh, meeting with the governor I'm not the governor with the secretary. That's correct. We're tentatively scheduled for Tuesday of next week. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, happy to have you join us again uh, when that when that happens. Representative Austin. Um, Jay, we did you have a presentation? And I don't know if Chair Webb uh, built it into the schedule, but on adult education as well. There. In the um, testimony that I sent in, there are four slides that speak to adult education and literacy, adult basic education. Um, so it's, uh, we have I time. can come back and present have, if you we have, want. We have, we have time. Okay. I think we, we don't have, we're, is that correct, Jesse? Oh, I do see uh, Becky Wasserman in the room. So we'll yeah. have four slides. Um, and then I think we'll need to start moving on. So I see Representative James, you might have something. So yes, please go ahead then. Okay, do you want me to share my screen or should I just talk through? And I can just talk to you. Why don't you just talk here. through? I, I know that, that we can certainly pull it up. It's on our website right now. I've, I'm looking at it right now. Yeah. So I'm on, I'm on slide 21. And I, um, since I oversee and you know, help support these teams, I wanna make sure that I'm talking about adult education and literacy too. Um, 
And so adult education and literacy is a pathway to a diploma um, and a pathway to better employment for a lot of people. There are 26,000 people in Vermont uh, over the age of 25 that don't have a high school diploma. And the adult education and literacy system serves these individuals. Um, and sorry, I'm a little too mouse happy today, I guess. So the state is divided into four regions and these regions are served by nonprofit entities. They're serving multiple towns, they have satellite locations. Uh, the nonprofit entities receive state and federal grants the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act Title II funds, specifically, and they get reimbursement for services from the state. They oversee the high school, uh, they implement the high school completion program, the agency oversees it. Um, and they also charge fees for services, get donations, and request appropriations from town. Um, the, so as I said, there are approximately 32,000 people in Vermont over the age of 25 that don't have a high school diploma. This adult education and literacy system in 2019 served 1,800 people. And this current year that we're in served 1,300 people. So there's an impact of the pandemic in the ability of the um, service providers to provide the services to the people who need it most, people who are living in poverty, who don't have access to technology, who might not have access to transportation, really vulnerable populations. So of that 1,800 people served last year, 82% were between the ages of 16 and 44 because of high school completion program. 33% um, uh, were Black, Indigenous, or persons of color, and that's mostly in Chittenden County. And then 57% of program participants were women. And studies suggest that the education level of the mother indicates the edu you know, what is going to happen with the child, the literacy level of the child. And so this because of how this uh, system is organized, delivery through nonprofit entities, they haven't been able to receive any emergency pandemic assistance because they're nonprofits, they're, they're not education entities. They've, they've gone out on their own and got PPP loans and some other types of support, but this, this particular system, because of how it's organized has, and, it, it serves real, very vulnerable populations has not been able to receive any pandemic assistance. And so I, I um, and just, you know, I wanted to share this information with the committee because it's an area of our education system that we don't really talk a lot about, but it is really crucial to people's economic mobility and the ability to get better paying jobs. That sounds like something we will need, probably need to take up. Um, I'm not so sure we can do it right now, <laughs> um, but definitely puts us towards another, another conversation. Uh, I'm gonna take one more question from Representative James, and then we're gonna need to move on to 426 because we have limited time with Rebecca Wasserman. So, so Representative James, last question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair Webb. And Jay, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I had been following up it uh, it's my understanding that the uh, four centers made a request for um, ARPA funding that didn't make it into this year's, into our current proposed budget. So I, I just wonder, uh, you know, it's probably too late at this point um, to do something about that. I, I wonder if there's legislation we need to be looking at next year or something to organize the system differently so that they're not having to come with their ha hand out all the time. Yeah. I, I was really disappointed to hear that their funding request had been denied, but I know that's a larger question. I, I just wanted to kind of toss that out there for future and um, yeah. seems well, like they're getting shut out of the COVID money. I appreciate the question um, and, and the idea to look at how the system is organized. Um, the House passed H-159, which um, includes an 
an area of study for adult CTE, which is operated through the tech centers, but there's a, an overlap of the population. Um, the Senate is working on uh, modifications to it. I just testified to House Commerce again yesterday to add adult education and literacy to the study and to uh, shift to the area of responsibility from the Department of Labor to the Agency of Education. So we would, we're proposing with the Department of Labor to examine the adult CTE system and adult education and literacy system. And that was also a specific call out in the, the select committee on the future of a public post-secondary education that it was not addressed in their report, but that it should be. So uh, I think we're, we're thinking along the same lines. Great, and thanks. I, and I do know that our Commerce and Economic Development uh, Committee has been uh, paying attention to this while we have not. So thank you um, very much. We will be uh, looking forward to hearing from the governor and um, I'll certainly hear that this is a concern. Thank forward. you. Thank you.